Welcome to Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast, the show where we seek to uncover what leadership means in today's world. I'm Joe Hart, CEO of Dale Carnegie, and we will be talking to diverse leaders with stories to tell across various industries to help unlock your potential for success. We will be sharing real life insights into leadership which in turn can help spark the next level of your growth as a leader. Today's guest is a veteran of the United States Coast Guard who received numerous military awards, including the Distinguished Service Medal, which is the nation's highest military peacetime recognition for a performance of duty. In November 2021, he was awarded the Rear Admiral J. Robert Looney Patriot Award by the Navy League of the United States. He's actively involved with several other public service and nonprofit organizations, serving on boards with the National Coast Guard Museum, U.S. Naval Sea Cadets Corps, and the Uniformed Services Benefit Association. We are so excited to welcome retired Master Chief Petty Officer of the United States Coast Guard, Dr. Vince Patton. Vince, welcome to the Dale Carnegie Take Command podcast. Great to have you with me today. Thank you for having me, Joe. I'm really excited about being on this presentation. Well, me too. And you've got so much, I think, to teach me and our listeners about leadership. You served as the eighth Master Chief Petty Officer of the United States Coast Guard. Tell us a little bit about you, though. What led you to the Coast Guard and what were you doing in your life before you did that? First of all, let me explain the position of the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. It's a combination of both a rank as well as a position. Each of the military services, your senior ranking person is an officer, be it a general, four-star general or four-star admiral, depending on the service. And for the Coast Guard, it would be a four-star admiral who is known as the commandant of the Coast Guard. Each of the service chiefs, these four-star generals and admirals, they are allowed to pick one enlisted person among their whole ranks, that person will serve during the tenure of that service chief as the senior enlisted person for that entire service. This position started back in 1967 during the Vietnam War by Congress when Congress decided that the generals and admirals didn't really know what was going on with their people. And so the Senate Armed Services Committee created this particular position. Getting picked for this role is pretty much in the same manner as how the service chief also gets picked. So that's how I became the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. And and my number, I'm the eighth Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. So since the creation of the position, they're up to number 13 now. They're about to have the number 14 picked this year. And it usually serve a four-year term with your service chief. And that's kind of how it is. So that's how that position is created. So it's important to tell you that because to tell you a little bit about myself is also how I ended up into that prestigious role. I was born and raised in Detroit, Michigan. So I'm the fifth child, third boy of 10 children. I like to say that during the course of my life and growing up in inner city Detroit, really had, a, I would say, a wonderful childhood. I mean, I can look back and see where there were a lot of challenges and living in sometimes in little impoverished conditions and so forth, but I never really saw it that way. I just had a great time in my childhood. My brothers and sisters were phenomenal siblings as well as friends and so forth. Well, I kind of locked on to my oldest brother, who is eight years older than I am, locked on to him in the sense of that I always saw him as probably one of the most successful people I had ever known. The things he did as he grew up, he became a Boy Scout. I wanted to be a Boy Scout. He became an Eagle Scout. I wanted to be an Eagle Scout. There was, it still is, a prestigious high school in Detroit called Cass Tech. It's a citywide school. You've got local schools in the city. To get into Cass Tech, you got to have good grades. My brother Greg got in there and I wanted to get in there. So I pretty much followed my brother's footsteps as far as I can go. I really enjoyed doing that. And I think he enjoyed it as well. I'm sure he got a pretty good kick and ego out of the fact that little brother was wanting to be like him in a lot of ways. So it was a great upbringing. And Let's bring up a little bit about how I ended up in the Coast Guard. Well, (laughs) my brother, Greg, when he finished high school, he joined the Navy. There's an eight-year difference between the two of us. So when he finished high school, went into the Navy, he's 18, I'm 10. So from age 10 to the time I was going to graduate, and I was actually going to be 17 and a half when I graduated, all I thought about in my continuing quest to 
be like my brother Greg was I was going to join the Navy. My brother was sending me pictures, homes of things of what he was doing in the Navy. And in fact, one summer I got to go visit him when uh, he was at a unit. And I got to spend the night at the unit in a barracks. So it was like one of the coolest things I could ever think of. So I'm going to be like my brother, Greg. On my 17th birthday, I'm a senior in high school. And my 17th birthday fell on November 21st, 1971, which was on a Sunday. And because all I talked about from age 10 up through that point was joining the Navy, my parents, knowing this is all I talked about, said, we got a birthday present for you. We'll sign for you to enlist in the Navy. Now, there's a program called the uh, Delayed Enlistment Program, which means if you're a senior in high school and at least age 17, you can enlist into the military, any military service. And then when you finish high school, off you go. I just couldn't wait for the fact that I was going to run down a recruiting office the next day on Monday, November 22nd, 1971, go down to the Navy recruiting office in the downtown Detroit and join the Navy. Got out of school that day. In fact, I even skipped my last class because I was so excited about going to join the Navy. I told all my friends that day, uh, hey, when I get out of school, I'm going down to join the Navy. So (laughs) I went down to the federal building in downtown Detroit where all the recruiters were, walked in, and there was this long, narrow hallway where all of the recruiters were, the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, and so forth. And so I looked down at the end of the hallway, and I saw this guy sitting in a Navy uniform at his desk, and he's on the telephone. I said, ah, Navy recruiter, make a beeline for the office. As soon as I walk into the office and he's on the phone, so he stops the phone call, looks up at me and says, have a seat. I'll be right with you. I get ready to sit down. And just as I get ready to sit down, I notice something a little different. Well, this guy sitting at the desk, he is wearing a Navy uniform, you know, the blue as they call the Cracker Jack sailor suit. So that didn't look out of the ordinary, but the pictures on the wall got my attention because you see, Navy ships are gray. And these pictures of ships that I saw were all white and painted in letters on the side of the ship said, Coast Guard. I walked into the wrong recruiting office. You see, back then, the Coast Guard uniform was the same as the Navy uniform. The uniform didn't really change until 1976. So back then, the hats were different, but, you know, this was indoors. All I see is a guy in a Navy uniform, and that was it. Well, I knew a little bit about the Coast Guard. I just knew that the Coast Guard existed, but that's all. So I'm embarrassed, and now that I've made at least some eye contact with the recruiter, I decided I'll uh, pretend to listen to him, then I'll go find the Navy recruiter. Well, while he's on the phone talking, I'm walking around the office and I'm just very nervous. I couldn't sit down. And I start looking at the pictures and they look, you know, exciting. You know, there's a picture of a Coast Guard boat that's kind of dancing out of the water, you know, the uh, motor surf boat that actually can flip over into the surf and right itself and so forth. That was an exciting picture. Then there was a picture of a Coast Guard icebreaker down in the South Pole. There's a penguin standing next to it. I thought that was a pretty cool picture. And then I come across what is called a unit citation, a written award that's given to an entire unit. And it kind of got my attention because I said, well, you know, while a guy's on the phone talking, I may as well read this thing. So this citation was in regard to a rescue the Coast Guard was involved in in 1952, took place off the coast of Cape Cod, Massachusetts. In fact, even to this day, it is known as the greatest rescue of the Coast Guard, where two freighters were caught up in a uh, nor'easter storm. Both of the freighters broke in half, going down fast. They called the Coast Guard. The Coast Guard, of course, went out to rescue uh, these two freighters. The one particular unit that went out to rescue one of the freighters went out in a small 36-foot motor surf boat, which when you think about seas that were somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 feet high, a crew of four going out to this uh, broken half freighter, a crew of about 30 people on board. They had to put all these people on board this vessel. Well, anyway, long story short, 
The Coast Guard went out there to save the day. They saved all but one of the crew member. In fact, this rescue was so dynamic. Disney made a movie about it called The Finest Hours. And if you haven't seen the movie, it's fascinating to watch. In fact, you watch it and say, this couldn't have happened, but it's a true story. So anyway, I have to tell you that because in reading that citation, it was telling the story. So after I read it, I said, wow. Well, the Coast Guard recruiter stopped his phone call, looked at me, pointed and said, I guarantee you'll have one of those in your first four years in the Coast Guard. That's how I joined the Coast Guard. <laughs> well, it's kind of, it's, it's so ironic. I mean, that you were so determined to join the Navy. You loved the Navy. Your brother was in the Navy. You sat at the wrong table. <laughs> and then you spent how many years following that in the Coast Guard? 30 years. 30 years. So it's one of those happenstance kind of things. It's just really kind of a funny thing. So what was it like, because you rose to leadership within the Coast Guard, so talk about some of the leadership experiences that you had. What did you learn about leadership in the Coast Guard? Well, I earned an awful lot. And I think I'll continue on a little bit of my story that after I joined the Coast Guard, in order to answer that question on leadership, I report to Cape May, New Jersey, where the Recruit Training Center is located. That's at the southern tip of New Jersey. And boot camp back then was 10 weeks long. Again, I was just as equally excited. I'm going into something. And I tell you, at that time, I didn't even think I was going to be in longer than a four-year enlistment. However, two weeks into the Coast Guard, I decided I wanted to stay forever. And the reason how that came about was there was a picture that was hanging on the wall. We recruits would walk by it all the time and think nothing of it. But I stopped to look at this picture because I found it a little interesting intriguing as well as fascinating. Now, why that was about was that they got these floodlights on it. So the guy in this portrait must be somebody interesting and as well as important. So I look at the picture and then I say, wow. And I go to my drill instructor known as a company commander. And so I decide to ask this question, sir, there's a picture of what I think is a master chief that's on the uh, quarter deck, which is sort of the receiving area of the barracks, who is he? So my drill instructor, as drill instructors are, they can only talk to you when they shouting at you. <laughs> he gets into my face and he yells and he says, that's the master chief petty officer of the Coast Guard. So as I stand at attention, when I ask the question, and usually recruits don't ask that many questions two weeks into the service, <laughs> I decided to uh, ask another question. Well, sir, what does he do? The company commander looks at me again and he says, he tells the commandant what to do. You know, the commandant who is the four-star admiral. I said, this guy's a master chief. He tells the commandant what to do. This got to be a pretty interesting job. I decided two weeks into the Coast Guard, I'm going to be the master chief petty officer of the Coast Guard someday. Now, of course, that means you got to stay in longer than four years. Was that then your target from that point forward? I mean, that was my target from that point forward. I knew nothing more than what my company commander said that he tells the commandant what to do. But I was going to find out a lot more than that. And over the course of that part of my career, I began to become a student and getting to understand and learn that particular position, which brings to your question about the leadership side of it is that, you know, the position of the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, as I explained at the very beginning of our talk here, is that the senior ranking enlisted person of the service who is responsible for the advice to the commandant, as well as to Congress on the health and well-being of everybody in the service, as far as how well they're doing, compensation, training matters, operational readiness. I mean, it's a pretty heavy job, particularly for one person to advise your service chief who actually makes all the decisions to ensure that the service chief is making the proper sound decisions and making sure that it's in concerted effort with ensuring that the people who work for you are able to carry out that particular mission. So probably the best way to describe it is that you're a cheerleader, you're a consultant, 
you are an advisor, you're the chaplain, you're, you're all kinds of things to people in terms of what's needed in the service. So you, you have to learn an awful lot about what goes on in the service as a whole. So that was when I said I was a student of that particular position. It meant that I had to learn an awful lot about the Coast Guard as a whole. Now, my occupational specialty, when I started out in the Coast Guard, I was in communications, which I really enjoyed doing that. And I kind of got caught into that by virtue of my involvement of being in the Naval Sea Cadet Corps in high school, as well as in the Boy Scouts, I knew Morse code. And this is back in the days of Morse code, you know, did it, da, da, did it. I was pretty good at Morse code. So when they found that out in boot camp, it wasn't easy talking me into doing it. And it was a great job because uh, here I'm in the, sort of the action of things. I'm involved in search and rescue cases, passing the information on to make sure we launched helicopters as well as vessels out or positions that had to be plotted, all kinds of stuff that I was able to do. Oh, and by the way, when my recruiter told me that he guaranteed that I would have a unit commendation within my first two years of the Coast Guard, he was absolutely right. In my first two years in the Coast Guard, on my first ship, we were involved in a medical evacuation rescue case, and it was in bad weather, and we were able to do it and so forth. So the whole unit got a unit commendation for that. So I guess what I'm trying to sum up here is split-second decision-making are responsible in the world of the communication side. You know, you made this decision two weeks in that you basically wanted to be, let's call it the CEO, or you wanted to be like the assistant to the CEO, the co-CEO, Right. That's a huge goal. A lot of our listeners have the aspiration of advancing in their careers. You know, what advice would you have for someone who aspires to leadership? What should they do to take on, you know, leadership to prepare them for a role like that? I think I was gifted with imagination. And I think that that has really served me well as far as imagination goes from the standpoint of wanting to be like my brother to when I joined the Coast Guard. And in that imagination and in that way of deciding of things of what I want to do, I reached out to find things that were helpful for me. I go to a um, quote that I came across in 1979 that was said by uh, one of the famous soccer players, Pele. He said, Success is no accident. It is hard work, perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, but most of all, love of what you're doing or learning to do. So that quote became sort of my core values initially in terms of anchoring myself into things that I wanted to do in terms of trying to get ahead and what was important. So the key route to that was love of what you're doing. And I think that kind of started that whole process for me. And it seemed like you loved what you were doing. There was also a component of this that was about service, right? I mean, you wanted to serve. Speak to that if you would. The service aspect, I have to credit my brother a lot. It was watching him and the involvement that he was doing with the Boy Scouts and the service part I found to be quite interesting because I found it as a knack and something that I enjoyed to do. Joining the Coast Guard, particularly with what the Coast Guard's mission is all about and so forth, was clearly centered around what service was, about helping people and things along those lines. And I've always found that because it really anchored that love of what you do, the energy, the passion, enthusiasm of getting things done and doing the kinds of things that what I wanted, I think sort of flourished when it comes to leadership for me. You talked about imagination being you know, kind of a trait that you have. What other skills were really important as you advanced through the ranks? Well, first and foremost is communication. Here's a little side story is that I was a stutter as I grew up as a child, a habitual stutter. I worked at it. And that was kind of the real big challenge that I had was that if I wanted to be successful, first and foremost, I had to get over something that was going to be a problem for me, that I refused to accept the fact that I could not communicate effectively. I refused to accept that I couldn't do that. So I worked very hard at that. And I think that was what at least began to help build the foundation for me in terms of reaching for that success, reaching for the types of things that are necessary and important in the world of leadership. Well, it's a critical point. And because all of us have limitations. In your case, 
Stuttering was something that you could hear, others could hear. We all have limitations, you know, that we need to work on. Sometimes they're not visible, but the fact that you had that introspection and that determination, how did you overcome stuttering? Because that's not an easy thing to do either. I came home one day, I was in the fourth or fifth grade. I came home one day with a note for my parents to sign for me to go into a speech therapy class that was offered at school. My stepfather said, you don't need that. And my mother says that I do. My stepfather says, no, he doesn't need that. He can learn and get out of it. So what my stepfather told me to do every day when I came home from school was to sing the Star Spangled Banner. Now, why sing the Star Spangled Banner? Because I didn't stutter when I sang the Star Spangled Banner. And that started building me confidence. I would go out in the backyard and sing it at the top of my lungs. And that grew to reading articles in the newspaper out loud. And as I was doing those things, I didn't stutter. And it was a practice I kept up all the way through high school that little by little, the stuttering went away. Well, it was a very interesting approach. I mean, I wonder if your mother and your stepfather kind of argued about that a little bit, but it sounds like the wisdom of your stepfather came through. Vince, when you were in the Coast Guard, there were times that are defining moments. Would you say there were ever any defining moments or points that were critical to you as you look back and think about your career to really advancing to the level that you did? Oh, gosh, so many to tell you, but here's the most defining moment. Much later in my career, when I became a command master chief, this is actually one level below becoming master chief petty officer of the Coast Guard. I was assigned to a a joint task group, which is a joint service operation that occurred down in Haiti. It was in the mid nineties, a UN peacekeeping mission called Operation Support Democracy. Uh, Haiti elected president Aristide, he was kicked out of office by just a bunch of thugs and so forth. And so the UN got involved to reinstall him back in. And at that point, the United States sent peacekeeping forces along with several other countries involved to do security on the streets of Port-au-Prince and other parts of Haiti and so forth. And I was selected as a senior enlisted advisor for that joint task force, which meant that I was senior enlisted advisor, not just to people who are in the Coast Guard, but the people in other services. So the, here's where the defining moment of that is. is first and foremost is, is that this is probably about as close to combat that I was ever in, if you want to call it that, at that time in very serious civil unrest. You've got the streets just flooded with people with guns and the lawlessness that was going on there and so forth. And I remember driving through the streets of Port-au-Prince and there was a sort of a riot that was kind of going on. And our role was, a, was to stop that particular riot. Uh, the group of soldiers that I was with that came in to stop this, you know, there were a few guys that kind of lost their cool, that the soldiers kind of lost their cool. And, and as they pulled their weapons out and so forth, I kind of got in the middle of it. I said, no, we're going to resolve the matter peacefully. My interpreter helped me in talking to the people to resolve it peacefully. But it was a very harrowing moment that really would have gone a wrong way and so wrong of a way that it would have certainly been on the six o'clock news of what would have gone wrong. So I consider that probably one of the most harrowing situations that I was ever involved in. That was sort of a defining moment and an opportunity that here's where communication had to work for me in order to make it work and to do communication with people who didn't understand what I was saying too. So I was just saying, so what did you learn about yourself in that? It sounds like you learned, you had this ability to communicate, to resolve, to bring people together. I think my confidence began to grow more and better as I started molding where my life was taking me and things of what I was doing. And while I was interested still in wanting to become the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard, you know, there was no guarantee that I was going to become the Master Chief Petty Officer of the Coast Guard. Whoever got picked as the commandant of the Coast Guard was the one who's going to make the selection. There's 350 people that he gets to look at to decide that. So I had about as much chance as 349 other people did. But the confidence that I kept over the course of my time in the Coast Guard, the things that I was able to do, the responsibilities that I had helped bring me about. But it also helped me formulate what I call today my core values, which are people, passion, and performance. And these are things that I didn't sit down and try to come up with some catchy phrase or anything. It's just over the course of my career, 
that people, passion, and performance began to take shape to help define my leadership responsibilities and philosophy. People are our greatest assets and taking care of the needs of our people. Passion was this sense of belonging, this point of enthusiasm, this love of what you do, you know, taking Pele's quote, that's where that passion came about. And then performance primarily was about prepare well so you can perform well. So the education that I sought while I was on active duty, the things that I did, as well as the mentoring aspect, working with other people, which also tied into performance, is how my people, passion, and performance came about. And this defines what I would say is my leadership philosophy. People, passion, and performance. So leadership means to you really it's the intersection of those three things. Absolutely. Leadership to me is the intersection of those three things, but to anyone, you can have Whatever phrase, comments, whatever it is that ties into what your leadership philosophy is, but the most important part is wrap it around core values. Create core values for yourself. Organizations, corporate industry, and so on, they all have core values in terms of the sort of define the conditions of employment and different things of what people do. But individually, you have your own into how you carry those things out. For me in the Coast Guard, my people, passion, and performance had to connect with the Coast Guard's core values, which are honor, respect, and devotion to duty. So it was so easy for me that once I understood what my personal core values were and be able to attach that with the service core value, I was always on track it became sort of the best way for me to be sort of the litmus test of if I'm doing the right kinds of things, as well as building those confidences that I needed in order to be successful. So is your advice then to leaders at any stage of their career? I mean, it's almost like stop right now. If you don't have core values, take some time, figure out what those are for yourself, write those down. Is that kind of how you really did it for yourself? I got to tell you, Joe, that's the true ingredient define your core values. Now, you may change them over periods of time because as experience goes, you see you may either capture more phrases or words or you may change them around, redefine them. And it's okay to do that. But it's all about creating your skin of what you are and who you are and your capabilities and your ability of handling responsibilities. It all starts with core values. And that's something that everyone should be very important to focus on really great leaders who've all said the same thing that you are. This is a common thread, which is when you define your values and you know what your values are, you're able to make decisions much more effectively, especially, you know, you talked about being decisive earlier. You can make quick decisions, you make the right decisions versus trying to figure out where you stand on something. And decisions are made when you are confident. And so you work on that confidence. And I find confidence is sort of the trunk of the tree and the roots are where my core values are and how I build toward that particular confidence. So confidence is so, so important in order to be effective. So many people struggle with confidence. Many people have inferiority complexes or they just really struggle. Was confidence ever an issue for you? And if so, how did you strengthen your confidence? No question. I think early in my life, confidence was a challenge for me. And I think that's part of where I I stuttered a lot. And as I started working my way through life back in high school and in the military and college and so forth, I would often come to that road of where that concern would come up. But I think more importantly, again, I go back to the core values that I always found there was something bigger than me that I had to always embrace to help me push through. That's always been sort of the best remedy for me to deal with being confident. Well, I guess if you have that North Star, that thing that's bigger than you, that's driving you, and you feel like, and you've got this passion for it, you're connected to it, then it draws you to it, right? I mean, that's what happened with you for sure. I mean, if you were two weeks in and you had this vision and you must have had all kinds of obstacles along the way, but you had your North Star. I have my North Star, and I, and I still have my North Star today. I mean, it has not abandoned me, uh, even though as I made it, what I successfully had wanted to do, it didn't stop there, and as it continues on even to this day. So what is your North Star now? Well, my North Star now is sort of continuing what I'm doing in terms of working with people that always help to try to be better, to always 
do better, to always excel for the sole purpose of being a mentor to someone else. And this brings on another one of my favorite quotes from Vernon Jordan, who says that you are where you are today because you stand on somebody's shoulders. And wherever you are heading, you cannot get there by yourself. If you stand on the shoulders of others, you have a reciprocal responsibility to live your life so that others may stand on your shoulders. It's the quid pro quo of life. We exist temporarily through what we take, but we live forever through what we give. So that's my North Star. So legacy is very important. And it's not that, that I want to big statue or something like that. I'd much rather see someone who I have worked with, them becoming successful, name a school or building or ship or after them. And I've actually been successful with some of that happening to this day that I've been very happy about, but that's continues to be my North Star and it will be always forever giving. You know, I'm 67 years old now and I'm nowhere near where I see the end of the runway to where, okay, I've done enough. Well, we have this one life here. We may as well give as much as we can, right? I mean, absolutely. What a powerful quote, though, from Vernon Jordan that you recited in a powerful North Star, because the reality is all of us are where we are because of other people who helped us. And then that creates a responsibility. We need to help and mentor other people who are trying to be the best that they can be as well. And it's the other part of not forgetting where you came from. You know, I did not get to where I am by myself. This whole thing, and I talk about the confidence and Greg Patton, my brother, gets a chunk of credit for all of that. But then there are a lot of other people over the course of my life that also draw into that. I will never forget that. And I always feel that the only thank you that I can give for them is to carry on and the successes that I've grown into is to uh, build that with other people. That's great. Well, it's a great commitment and a great thing to do. You've had now 67 years of life. You've got wisdom. You've achieved uh, great things in your life. If you were to look back with everything that you know today and talk to a younger Vince Patton, what advice might you give yourself? What do you know today? What have you learned today? And say, this is an epiphany. I wish I'd known this when I was 22. If I were to talk to me 50, 40, 60, whatever years ago, some of the formulations that has helped me is how imagination is so important, but just don't imagine, put it to use. And I'm blessed that I've had the opportunity that I just dream all the time. I dream with the intent to find where reality was going to come about. So what I would say to me at the younger years is about, yeah, it's fine to dream. It's fine to imagine, but put it to use. And that's what's been my success. Awesome. That's terrific. Vince, I know you worked at military.com, what was a startup at one point, ended up being a very successful uh, venture. What was your role there and how did you get involved in that? I served at uh, military.com for seven years and I was uh, director of community outreach. And basically what that was, was linking the company, military.com, to the military community. One of the successes of when the program was built in its early infancy within the first couple of years, we were in the two, three million mark. And it was just a great program that allowed veterans to understand what they're entitled to. That was the key thing. I was just curious. I know Chris Michael is like one of your biggest fans. If you have a fan club, he's your founding member and your number one fan. So, <laughs> Well, Chris is mine. No question about it. You know, in the world of entrepreneurship, Chris Michael wrote the book on it because there's a guy you want to talk about imagination and vision and moving it forward, you know, and let's go back to the early 2000s when the internet was still sort of fairly new at that particular point and how he took that through military.com and built a platform that is extremely successful even today. And with a lot of spinoffs of different other companies that are doing that, Chris, absolute genius. I am his fan as well. <laughs> well, we might compete for that. He is one of the most interesting, cool people I know. I mean, yes, he's he is. a really brilliant guy and a true gentleman. So <laughs> you are a 1976 graduate of the Dale Carnegie course. You took this in the Chicagoland area. What led you to take the Dale Carnegie course, Vince? Well, I went on recruiting duty in Chicago, but a friend of mine who was a recruiter, he told me about 
the Dale Carnegie course. He had taken this Dale Carnegie course and saw it was really exciting. He gave me some ideas of what it was about. And I actually invited me to sit in a class that he was in. And I was hooked. The whole interaction that I saw with people and, and ability of being able to uh, open up a lot more. I mean, I've always considered myself something of an extrovert, but whenever I'm put into a very new situation, to get it out of me takes a while. So when I went to the first Dale Carnegie or the session that he was in, he was probably halfway finished with it at the time. I was hooked. I said, this is for me. Then I think another month later, I ended up getting into the program and I really enjoyed it. You know, it's funny because now, you know, 1976, that's what, 45 years ago? I think of it like I finished it yesterday because there was so much that I got out of the course. Dale Carnegie didn't as much teach me anything as much as it took what I knew or fine-tuned the things of what I could do. And that helped me. That helped me with that confidence building. That helped me with the communication. That helped me even as I talk today about my personal core values. I mean, core values wasn't a term back then, but I can readily give some credit to the Dale Carnegie course for the fact that I needed to have something to anchor to. And I learned that through Dale Carnegie. Well, it's interesting. One of the first things that we do in a Dale Carnegie course is talk about vision. Vision gets people challenged around what are your values? Because, you know, the things that are important to you are connected to your values and the things you want to achieve in your life. So Vince, terrific interview. Any final pieces of advice for our listeners? This is not an advertisement for Dale Carnegie as much as I really want to say how much the program, and I'm delighted to see it's still going today. And I think, Joe, when you and I talked earlier, it's well over 100 years of operation of a very well put together true program that I didn't think of Dale Carnegie in 1976 as a stepping stone of understanding leadership as much as I do today that it is. But I will say that uh, having a program, something like that, truly is a real good foundation to helping individuals build upon what their leadership philosophies are, as well as, most importantly, identifying what the core values Awesome. Well, thank you. It is definitely about bringing out what is uh, each person. Each person is different. So it's about celebrating that. Uh, Vince, thank you so much for being with me today. Really appreciate you. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. In today's Thought Leadership Spotlight segment, our guest will talk about how we can help people achieve things they never thought of by arousing an eager want in the other person. Like Dr. Vince Patton, our guest reminds us how to raise your expectations and never give up even in difficult situations. Please welcome the president of Dale Carnegie, Rochester, Buffalo and Boston, Doug Escher. There I was, day one of a three week intense training to become a United States paratrooper. And it was July, Fort Benning, Georgia. It was hot, it was miserable. So day one, we're out there, we're going through the ropes and it made Basic training looked like it was a Cub Scout camp. This was really intense. So at the end of the first day, you had an opportunity to quit because you can't make someone be a paratrooper. It's strictly volunteer. And I said, I'm not going to do this for three weeks. This is what I thought I was buying into. So I told the Sarge next to me, and this guy's about 12 foot nine. And he looked at me, pointed his finger at me, said, you're not quitting. You can do this. You're going to do it. And I'm going to do it with you. And he used principle number three, create an eager want from Dale Carnegie. And you know what? He raised my expectation. I went through the process for that three weeks. It was absolutely miserable. But when I finished and after the fifth jump, they let you know in loudspeakers, you are now an official United States Army paratrooper. You are now airborne. And you know, there was 1,300 guys taken this training. I was selected one out of 25 based on my performance to be able to evaluate the program. So what I say to you is use Dale Carnegie principle number three, like that great Sarge did to me, create an eager want, and you'll be surprised how you can help that person achieve things they never thought of. I hope you enjoyed this edition of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast. 
Check out our resources page at www.dalecarnegie.com for more research, insight, and tools that will support your success in taking command of your leadership potential. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider rating it and subscribing to us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. As always, thank you for listening, and we look forward to you joining us for the next episode of Take Command, a Dale Carnegie podcast.